This episode of Reality Escape Pod is brought to you by Morty, virtual escape games, and Patreon supporters like you. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need to get away from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's guests are my wife, Lisa, Repod producer, and our editor, Steve Ewing. Every episode this season, you've heard PG ask you, our dear listeners, to send us voicemails, emails, letters, fill out a survey, get in touch in some way, and let us know what's on your mind. Give us a topic to discuss. Tell us something we're doing well. Tell us something we're doing poorly. The day has come. The four of us are about to crack open the mailbag and see what's inside. Welcome, Lisa and Steve. Hello. Hello, thank you. Yay, I'm so glad that we finally got to a point in the podcast where we have enough material where we can do mailbags and get feedback on past episodes and, uh, you know, just hear from the listeners. This is very exciting. It's kind of like that Simpsons episode that says, it's come to this, the clip show. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we really didn't know what to expect from this. And uh, honestly, I didn't know until the other day when I just started to kind of take a look at what was in the mailbag. I had no idea what this episode was going to be. But we'll be discussing all manner of topics in immersive gaming and about the podcast itself. But we'd like to begin with the snail mail that inspired this. While we were working on pre-production for season three, we received a letter in our P.O. box from a couple of our favorite creators in the Netherlands, Alex and Sander from Logic Locks in Amsterdam. And the letter says, Dear Lisa and David, this year, nothing went as planned. In the same light, I don't think this card is going to reach you in time. I think he means in time for the holidays. It did not. Nevertheless. Things here are good, and we hope you are having a blissful time. We very much enjoyed Recon, and also, maybe even more, the podcast. It is the kind of escape room podcast we were always hoping for. Thank you so much for all your great work, Alexander and Xander. Logic locks. Wow, snail mail! Yeah, and... um, (laughs) They, they're the makers of uh, the game The Catacombs in Amsterdam, which is one of the must-plays in Amsterdam. We have um, possibly criminally not had a Dutch creator on this show yet. So that is something that I am guaranteeing we will remedy in Season 4 and onwards. And at some point, we, are, we have to have Alexander and Sander on because they are fantastic. We have played their game Catacombs twice. Once in real life and once online over the pandemic. It's true. And I think um, I'm going to be going over to Europe this summer to play games. And we're probably going to do Netherlands. And then we're thinking maybe Berlin. So um, do it. I'll be able do to do it. Yes, PG. I'm ex- Peer pressure. <laughs> do it. You're, the, the, the snail mail is what convinced me. <laughs> That's it, folks. Just send us snail mail and PG might fly across the world. <laughs> Steve, you're going to be controlling the voicemails. We have a whole bunch of messages. Some of them came in over email. Many of them came in over voicemail. And um, Steve's going to be controlling that. So let's, let's take it from the top. What do we got? Hi, this is Brett Kaner from New Jersey. The number one thing I appreciate about Repod is that you guys give the guests a chance to talk. For example, you recently had Johanna Kalyonen on as a guest. She's got incredibly deep knowledge and is fantastic at conveying not only the what of design, but also the why and the how. The best thing an interviewer can do is give her a nudge in a particular direction, then just sit back and listen. And that's exactly what you did. Thanks. Brett Keener with his wonderful, deep radio voice. (laughs) I'm so glad he sent us in a message. And large bag of puzzles. If you ever encounter Brett in the wild, Brett is always carrying a bag of puzzles for friends and strangers. Well, he's known as that guy with the puzzles. It's true. <laughs> Brett, the, um, I think the episode with Johanna was a- an interesting and extreme example because we've, we've really tried to adapt around the guests that we have. And when it came to Johanna, it was very clear that the best thing we could do was get out of her way. And I have to give credit to Steve also 
the edit on that episode was really stellar and there was a lot of content. Johanna was very easy to interview, though, because you just had to give her the slightest nudge and she is off and running. <laughs> well, we could barely keep up. <laughs> She's just an avalanche of knowledge. You just like make a little like just a little bit of disturbance and all of it just comes pouring out. I feel like everybody has like file cards of certain things they know about. And each one of her file cards must be massive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Steve, what's our next voicemail? Uh, hi, is this the room escape expert? Oh, sorry, artist. Yeah, I want to book for tomorrow sometime. Um, you know, <laughs> 6 30 p.m. is ideal. Um, so yeah, call me back as soon as possible. Uh, oh, it's for my three year old's birthday. So I really hope it's not like, scary or anything uh if it is can you just go ahead and like remove all that stuff that'd be cool thanks bye i'm not sure we may have got a like, misconnection there uh, did, that come, did that come in on april fools uh, there may be a few prank calls that came in um <laughs> i mean you know that doesn't sounds so different from my life answering the room escape artist email address yeah, we've definitely gotten crazier customer service requests. I mean, I just answered a customer service question last week. They wanted to book with us in like three days. And I was like, uh, you need to look at the review and click the button over to the company that you want to schedule with. We cannot help you with that. My personal favorite experience with this was when somebody sent the Room Escape Artist Facebook page a message in a different language. Um, I think that they were Dutch. They were Dutch, yes. They were Dutch. Um, accusing us of selling them tickets and not being there for the time that they bought tickets for. And I wrote back to the person and said, like, hey, you know, I'm not sure what to tell you. I don't know what company you were looking to book with, but we're escape room reviewers based out of the United States, not escape room owners in the Netherlands. You should probably figure out who you bought the tickets from and contact them. And the person wrote back to me a furious message telling me that I was a business owner and that I needed to be accountable for my actions. I was like, please spend a few minutes on my website. Like, I, I think that this will become clear to you. Anyway, they never wrote back after that. Probably for the best that they didn't go into play an escape room also is <laughs> what I'm what I'm hearing. <laughs> Touche. Who do we got next, Steve? Hi, I'm Haley E.R. Cooper. And I'm Cameron Cooper from Strange Bird Immersive in Houston. And we absolutely love Repod. In fact, um, while an episode is usually only 60 minutes long, we tend to uh, take two hours or maybe even three hours to listen to it because we listen to it together. And we're always hitting pause in order to discuss what we just heard, dive down deeper into it. And um, it's constantly inspiring and giving us a lot of new content in our lives. And um, we started listening to it together because uh, we once listened to it separately. And I listened to the Nick Moran episode and I said, Haley, you got to listen to this. I don't mind. Put it on right now. So I've heard it twice. Uh, and then later on, I was listening to a, an episode to catch up where Cameron was um, and the Nick Moran episode played automatically again. And I was like, yep, I'm done with listening to this twice. So I think that has to be our favorite episode. Uh, if I were the kind of person who put bumper stickers on my car, I would get a bumper sticker that said structure is content. That phrase was so inspiring to me because I'm really obsessed with structure and how that contributes to storytelling. It's the bones of the experience. It has some really great content that uh, everyone needs to think about when designing uh, escape room experiences, such as the audience is in the world, but not of it. I think that's uh, a really important concept to promulgate. And we also wanted to uh, mention that I uh, really love the new format for the Spoilers Club, the interviews with the creators. Uh, really brings in a lot of background information that we didn't always already know. Uh, and of course, the, the concept of the Spoilers Club itself is really great. We need uh, a place to actually talk about the details of these experiences other than dancing around it all the time. Yeah, and I think like usually you only get that experience if you go out for drinks with the creator afterwards, you know, but like diving into the details of the decisions they make along in the creative process, that is so exciting to me. Yeah, but... Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of miss in the new format, the review aspects. Uh, maybe it'd be nice to have a segment where it's just the two hosts talking about 
the things they liked the most, the things they didn't like. Uh, what about that segment? What did you like? What did you not? Finally, just one little suggestion. Embrace the loudness, loudness wars. <laughs> like I, I, re- I, I respect the, uh, you know, keeping the dynamic range and whatnot, but uh, that's just the way the world is. And uh, when I listen to something else after Repod, you know, it might uh, blast me in the ears a little bit because I had to turn you all up. Thanks for a great podcast. We are really enjoying it. Thank you, Haley and Cameron. There was a lot to unpack there, and um, they are inevitable guests on this show, for sure. Uh, I am huge fans of their work. Well, well, (laughs) I'm going to start leaning into the microphone from now on. I can be as loud as I want. (laughs) I'm always I'm always very, very loud. And Steve, our producer, always has to be like, can you stand back a little bit from the microphone? Because when you get excited, you not only get loud, but you also lean into the microphone. There's two different things going on here. There's getting loud into the microphone can cause you to peek out and make it not record well. But then there's the volume that we we edit it at and and master it at. And that's uh, there might be some room for us to elevate the volume there. We'll boost it. We'll boost the luffs. Maybe we'll uh, we'll do that starting with uh, with with the next season. I love that voicemail from them, though. I played a lot with Haley and Cameron when we went to Montreal and one of my favorite parts about playing with them, besides what good sports they are in the room, was the quality of conversations we have afterwards, because these are creators who really, really love dissecting the game. They love debating the points of escape room design. And um, and I love that they're so open to learning from other creators and designers as well. We have played a handful of games with Haley and Cameron, and they, we have exclusively played terrible games with them. And uh, I can tell you, actually, no, that's not true. We played one good one. The one we played in Houston was actually good. Yeah, I was going to say, that was the, that was fine. The, the one we played in New York together and the ones we played with them in St. Louis were not good. Truth. And you can have a very deep, very lengthy conversation with them about terrible games, too. <laughs> uh, I really liked what they had to say about the Spoilers Club as well, because that was actually my thought was I love having the creators on of course we get such deeper insight when we can have the creators come but um of course that means that we can't always give full feedback and i try to give constructive feedback but sometimes it's tough to nitpick a game when the creators there although for the most part david and i usually pick games that we enjoyed yeah we we've definitely tried to bias towards games that we're we're really enchanted by but I think that the the note is good that um, we, you know, we've been exploring different formats with the Spoilers Club. And if you listen to them from episode one to the most recent episode, we have experimented with a lot of different things. And I think we're zeroing in on a format that that works. But our take on things is is definitely something that is missing and a little bit more of a critical eye um, rather than just a behind the scenes walkthrough. I think a mixture of the two is is probably where we want to land. I think our high level Patreon backers who have been listening to the Spoilers Club this whole time have really gone on a journey. PG had this vision for the Spoilers Club would be this thing where we get to talk about the games. I mean, the way Haley and Cameron say, like as if we were at a bar after the game, like that's what we want and that's what we needed so much, especially during the pandemic. But what exactly that looks like when it's just David and PG talking about those games what should it be should it be more of a review should the creators be there giving behind the scenes details can it be both what else could it be we did one where we had uh, patreon backers play and and give their feedback too we've really been trying to find out what this is it's funny because we have spent eight years training ourselves to discuss these things without spoilers and um learning how to discuss them openly is surprisingly challenging but it's been a fun challenge and i and i'm really proud of where we've gotten and i think that uh i think that we're we're moving closer and closer to where we want this to be and then the last thing that came up was uh just the fact they were listening together and nick moran's episode i love that they listen together i i can picture them pausing and debating and discussing and do you agree with that? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 can, I can hear the conversation happening between the two of them. 
the call outs from Nick's episode are fantastic. I can also say that uh, they're not alone in Nick Moran being their favorite episode. No, in fact, we did collect some survey data for this mailbag. And we one of the things we looked at was from the episodes in season one and season two together, which were the favorite episodes. And three episodes jumped far out ahead as the most popular. And the very most popular one was Nick Moran, season two, episode two. And who did he beat out? He beat out in second place, Neil Patrick Harris, season two, episode one. Whoa! Yeah. I mean, that's really going to do great things for Nick's confidence. I think he's he's kind of a guy who lacks confidence. So, you know, I, I hope that's going to make him, you know, feel good. Oh, God. Well, you're never going to hear the end of this now. <laughs> <laughs> and the third episode, or I guess the third place uh, winner of most popular episodes was the episode with Anne and Chris Lukeman, season one, episode four. See you adventures. Well deserved. Totally well deserved. Well deserved. They, I think they're some of the most charming guests we've ever had. Let's hear another voicemail. Hey, BQ, this is Mr. Lama, an escape room enthusiast, but also a big Survivor fan, so it's cool to call in. Um, you, I thought you, you'd asked about, um, you know, things that you really like or dislike about certain escape rooms from an enthusiast point of view. And one of the biggest red flags for me um, is whenever I feel like I have a game master that is not 100% dedicated to making my experience as good as it can be, I really hate whenever I'm asking for a little bit of help and either I don't get a response or the game master um, tells me to do something I've already done or asks me what I've done already. Um, I feel like they should know that. Uh, for a little while, I owned, I owned an escape room, and I, I was committed to making sure we had one GM per game. It wasn't a situation, you know, where a game master is trying to juggle paying attention to a few different games or stepping out of the room. Hopefully that doesn't sound too entitled. I just think that that's a basic courtesy, a uh, customer service kind of thing that uh, customers should be able to expect when they walk into an escape room. Um, thanks for having me on. You guys have a good day. Thanks for your call and a Survivor fan. I love that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with what he had to say about game masters. It gets really frustrating when you feel like you've paid for this customized experience and you can tell that they haven't been paying attention. That's that's the most frustrating. Uh, where are you guys on? What have you know? What have you already solved? Um, yeah, that's awful. I, I also like I get really annoyed when they basically just tell you the answer and it's like, well, we asked, you know, like, have you looked in that? at that wall have you looked at the bookshelf have you explored everything on the bookshelf as opposed to did you look in the box on the third shelf you know what i mean like you still still give people a chance to discover things on their own maintain a little mystery yeah <laughs> i i think that mitchell really summed it up really well and the other thing that i think it's lost especially among enthusiasts is like we get annoyed when a game master isn't on the ball but like if you think about it from the perspective of a first time player who is not comfortable in the game, doesn't know their way around, is not going to win in a record time. You know, the um, the time that it takes for them to get a good hint could be the difference between them winning and losing, which could be the difference between them having a good or a bad time, which could be the difference between them playing another escape room again or not. So yeah, I I think that all of this so much of so much of what makes the escape room experience falls on the shoulders of the game master and there's no replacement for a good attentive game master for these companies that have multiple rooms six seven eight rooms what is the ratio typically of game master to room are they watching two rooms one room it varies from company to company um some of them have have really different structures and different approaches it's really all over the place. But if I had to guess, it seems to me like the typical escape room company has one game master per game, but it's definitely not 100%. And there are also some companies that have two or three, especially if there are performers involved. And we've certainly encountered companies that have far, far fewer uh, in that ratio. 
And as a person who calls escape room companies more often than the average person, I would say, you also get the people who are game masters and are answering the phones and running the front desk. Because I've definitely been on the phone with someone where they're like, wait, hold, please. My team needs a hint. I'm like, okay. I mean, at least you're paying attention to your team. We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing your escape rooms and other immersive social outings. I believe in it so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. I noticed Morty has just started adding little fun things like a mini puzzle, which I was surprised with when I opened it. I open Morty almost every day, by the way, just to kind of read reviews and plan future trips. But I opened it and there was a puzzle by none other than one of our hive minders, Matthew Stein, Enigmata. And when you finish the puzzle game, you get a little badge. And that's one of the other great features that I love about Morty. It's just a fun little thing where they award different badges and you can collect them. Like if you're kind of a collector like me, you like to collect patches, stickers. Well, you can collect badges on Morty and they give out badges for different things like attending recon, like being a repod listener. That's right, guys. If you're a listener of this podcast and if you want a badge, you can get a badge on Morty. They gave out a badge if you attended our live meetup. So I just appreciate all these little fun Easter eggs and fun little extras that they put in the app. You can learn more at mortyapp.com slash repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners. Link and details in the show notes. Let's hear who we have next. Hi there, this is Nathaniel Siegel, and I'm a big fan of Room Escape Artists. So seeing that posts are scheduled pretty far in advance, can you talk about the logic puzzle itself of planning content and how things have to be changed when you have a time-sensitive post or deadline to be met? Thanks. Wife, this question is for you. Yeah, this question is about the blog content rather than the podcast content. So while this podcast is happening each season, there is a blog publishing every single day. And we've published every single day for years. And it is my logic puzzle to keep content publishing. I have a couple of goals. I try to vary the content in a given week. So we would have an online review and a podcast show notes and a in real life review and a commentary piece and an announcement. I try to vary that as much as I can. Now that we have multiple authors besides just me and David, I also try to have different voices come in and not have you read one person back to back for uh, a while. I try to vary where the content is coming from now that we have online reviews coming in. There's only so much you can do with that if someone takes a trip to Los Angeles and plays far too many games like some people we know might have just done, then you're going to get a lot of Los Angeles reviews in a row because I do try to get them out as quickly as possible. Back in the day, I tried to keep everything within one month, then it slipped to two months just because we play a lot. And it's true, we do try to schedule because that allows us to travel and to focus on other projects and know that the content will just keep publishing. If Lisa and I were to get hit by a bus, the content would still keep churning out for quite a few weeks before anybody realized we were gone. But to Nathaniel's other question, Time sensitive stuff comes up all the time and things get bumped. And sometimes that's actually a cascading effect. Um, I'll ask, say, we have a reviewer who went to Vegas and she has four reviews. And I said, What order do you want these to publish in? And she told me, You know, some of them are from the same company, they reference each other, they have to go in the same order. I get a time sensitive piece of content that has to go up the day her first Vegas review was scheduled. Now I have a cascade of everybody needs to move back instead of I can just take this one piece and bump it to the back of the line. So the answer is it's complicated. Also, I believe that's Nathaniel Siegel, who uh, is out in LA. He is a magician who has a little bit of a puzzle bent to his performances. And uh, I've seen him on Penn & Teller fool us. Uh, so 
I will verify that that is the Nathaniel Siegel. And if so, I will put his video in the show notes. So our next question comes from Ben Rosner in Brooklyn, New York. And he says, hello, David and PG. So happy that you're doing a mailbag episode. My favorite episode so far has been the season two finale when you interviewed John Braver, the creator of Delusion. I really hope they expand to New York City someday so that I can finally try out one of their shows or experiences. A question I have for both of you. What is the escape room on your to-do list that you are most excited to get to play? Hope all is well and see you soon. Thanks, Ben. I probably have more escape rooms on my to playlist than David does, since David's probably played like everything. My my list is still pretty long. <laughs> uh, hopefully, I'll be doing the dome this summer uh, and the room. So those were the two that really were on my radar, especially after having interviewed Chris Latner. Like, I really want to go play his rooms. So that's why I convinced my team to do Berlin as the second city. For me, there's still a lot on the list. I mean, there's the game that topped Terpica this year. They're in uh, Spain. I think it's called, I think it tra- the name translates to You'll Float 2. I don't know anything about it other than everyone who has played it is um, absolutely in love with it. I really want to get back to Berlin and play, what's, what's Chris's? Brendan Darkmore. Brendan Darkmore, Yes. Crime Runners in Vienna, going underground. I've been wanting to get to that game for years. The Chamber in Prague, I just generally want to get there. In the US, Locurio's uh, Story Keeper, really want to get there. Servants of Slight in Florida. Those are probably the, the top on the list for me at the moment. That's a good list. I, I forgot about Spain, and I was just looking. They were like... Eight of the top 20 rooms on Tropica were in Spain. Yeah, there's a lot that I actually want to play in Spain, but that was the the one that I have the name sort of at the top of my head. Should I do PG's job and ask someone to explain what Tropica is? (laughs) (laughs) PG, can you please explain this term? The Tropicas are, let me see, the top escape room project. Did I get that right? Enthusiast Choice Awards. There we go. I lost the fight to just have it be called the Terra Awards. And um, (laughs) yes, it's a project by Rich Bragg. It's a community-driven project where people nominate and vote for their favorite escape rooms. And uh, it's a whole stack rank thing. There's a lot of math involved. Voters don't have to do the math. But you do have to verify that you have played at least 50 escape rooms. So this is not a ranking by casual players, as it says it is a ranking by enthusiasts. The thing that I like about it, and we're, Lisa and I are on the board, we share a vote on the board for Terpica. The thing that I like about it is that it's not a, it's not like a ridiculous contest where he's trying to drive traffic and encourage companies to spam their their customers into voting for them or something like that. It's not like a popularity contest in that way. It really does just come down to you have to have played, I think, 200 rooms to be a nominator, 50 rooms to be a voter. And it's really by people who love escape rooms for people who love escape rooms. And it's a it's it's a clever way of creating a list of great games to play around the world. Okay. What do we have next? Hi, David and PG. It's Riley Stock from Salt Lake City. Longtime listener, first time caller. Really excited for this mailbag episode. First, I want to shout your praises. Absolutely love the podcast. You two do an amazing job interviewing guests and getting such a cool variety of guests. In the board game world, we love a good theme. So in escape rooms, what are your favorite themes? What are your least favorite themes? And what's a theme you would like to see an escape room do? Keep up the great work. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Riley. I love Riley. Riley has an amazing podcast. The Board Game Community Show. Yeah. And he's fantastic. Just an absolute gem. Let's see. Themes that I like. I like almost anything if it's done well. But in a vacuum, I bias towards games that are set in a dream or a nightmare. And the thing that I like about that theme and that setting is that you can narratively justify anything. You can narratively justify 
any puzzle, any interaction, all sorts of stuff. And I think it works really well for the escape room medium. Also, you know, a hallucination counted in there for all of that. Yeah, I like, um, I, like I tend to like like dark horror themes, but I like anything really ridiculous as well. I love the whole Miss Jezebel thing where it was this kind of weird, ridiculous, comedic and horror. I just like really silly things that are kind of different. And like I said, I, I would like to see more modern, urban, gritty themes like Stash House. PG, if you like street themes, strong recommend for the Mad Rapper, which is yeah, near you. I, I, gotta, I gotta make my way down there. Yeah, I'm with PG. I'd like to see more funny room escapes. I did the uh, crazy cat lady's apartment in Portland and totally loved it. Oh my God, cat themes. So like, <laughs> I think it was actually Haley and Cameron that had a April Fool's post about doing a cat cafe escape room. And I was like, I would go to this 1000%. Like I was actually thinking the other day, like I wish I could go to an escape room where there were like actual animals in there. <laughs> I did an escape room in Poland that had a cat living in it, which was a Big struggle for me because I am seriously allergic to cats and this game involved a lot of crawling. I would be so distracted. I mean, <laughs> I really like magic themed games. The first game that we played where the hint system was a magic mirror, it was like the most amazing thing. I love holding a wand. Um, I think in a similar way to David loving dreams and hallucinations because anything is possible. I like magic because anything is possible in those fantasy worlds, too. Uh, I also really liked Lab Rat. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know that one gets mentioned a lot, but just it's not like anything else. You really feel transformed in that one. It's a great game. Dislikes. Yeah, I really dislike prisons. A prison game has to be exceptional for me to like it. And even then, I, it, it's not a theme I find especially comfortable. Same thing I'll say for asylums. I think that there are some instances of it being done really creatively, uh, but it, it's pretty loaded. I find like the prison break type style game challenging to enjoy. Any time where it's like either a lab game or some type of science fiction, I already know there's going to be math. I know there's going to be like a periodic table, chemistry, and I'm just... I'm just not into any of that. I think zombie in a room is probably done. Yeah, I think we've done enough of those. And I just don't like the extra level of challenge there. It's just not necessary to have to keep looking over my shoulder while I'm trying to do a puzzle. I get that. I, I feel like the the zombie on a chain theme and 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 trope has passed us by. I think we've been at escape rooms long enough that there are things that have fallen out of favor. And that one certainly seems to have evaporated. It was cool at its time. Uh, themes we'd like to see explored. That is a, that's, that's a more interesting question to, to, uh, to chew on. I would really like to see something like a who framed Roger rabbit type game something that's really playing with like animation as a as a concept humans in an animated world i would really love to see someone seriously explore that i want to see more studio ghibli games like i really want to be in howl's moving castle or have like totoro's in the game that's you know that's what i would like to see hi this is christina Eames, leaving a voicemail as requested what do i love about escape rooms well they're awesome. What's not to love about them? <laughs> My husband and I really enjoy doing them and you can learn a lot about yourself while you're doing them as well as develop yourself, which is why we wrote the book. Now what I, I hate to use the word hate about escape rooms, but what I dislike about escape rooms is it can be a very money intense interaction, hobby, exercise, etc. So hopefully I will talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, Christina. We recently had heard, heard an owner tell us about a escape room player who had written a book on uh, what people can get out of playing escape rooms, and we hadn't encountered this person. So glad to virtually meet you, Christina. The cost of escape rooms is a interesting question. It's when we've talked about in different forms, I think more in the bonus episodes than we have on the main episodes. 
I think that escape rooms are simultaneously both really expensive and really cheap, and it depends on which company you're going to. Some of these higher end companies that are that have performers who ha have beautiful, expansive sets or really thoughtful, deep, detailed game design and all of this effort that gets put into it, I think these games are a steal in that like thirty to forty five dollar price range. And then there are games that have very little love put in them, very little production value, very little thought, and paying thirty to forty dollars for them feels like a ripoff. Yeah. Ultimately you have to remember that you are playing a highly customized game that is an experience. It's a private experience for just you and your group of friends, be it one person up to like six, even maybe 10 people. But we expect a lot out of these. We expect the, we expect like Disney level scenery. You know, we want amazing games and puzzles. And then we also demand that there is one person dedicated exclusively to catering for clues and to game master our game. And we want only one person to, you know, to focus on us. And so all of that is going to come at a cost, I suppose, if you think of it that way versus thinking of it as a game. Yeah, you could buy a board game for $30 and play it over and over, but that's, it's not really the same thing. You have to just think of it as a customized experience. I was just going to respond to David and say, David, what you're really asking for is some price stratification in the market. Yes. And we've been practicing what we preach here. We've been playing fewer games and really focusing on finding the high quality ones and finding the ones that we enjoy committing the time, the money, the effort, planning these things, getting our group of people together. I think that we as an enthusiast community don't necessarily do ourselves a favor by just throwing tons of money at products that we are pretty sure we're not going to enjoy because we are we are feeding money back into the system. We are rewarding bad games when we knowingly book bad games. And as reviewers, we do do that. But I think there is a cost on the completionist side of this. And that is that we're also rewarding bad products that we wouldn't recommend that we don't want other people to play. And Christina, we'll have to check out your book. We'll, we'll be looking that up. Very glad that we discovered you through this um, mailbag episode because, yeah, David and I were in... Was it Maine? No, Williamsburg. We mm. were in Williamsburg and we were talking with an owner and he was talking about this couple who had played hundreds of rooms and written a book and he didn't have the book. He didn't know the name. He didn't know the name. He was just like, you have to meet them. So I feel like that is you. If you've never played in Williamsburg, I guess there's someone else out there like us all. Yep. Who do we have up next? Hey, David and PG, it's Tommy. Wanted to call and thank you for making your podcast because, I don't know, I think making an escape room type podcast is hard. Uh, I think it's easy to get trapped in a certain type of episode, but I really want to applaud the variety of guests you've had on. Even though you've lowered your standards and kind of slummed it with me, I think the fact that you get on board game people and immersive theater and different areas that are adjacent to the escape room space to me is widening the playing field i guess it's showing how big this playground that we all work in really is and it's really cool i think the questions you ask the way you dive into this profession i don't know if i were to have made a podcast it would have been this kind of curiosity driving what you guys explore and how you plan your guest. So I just want to compliment you and say, keep up the amazing work. And it was an honor to be on the show. And I'm excited for three more seasons and a movie. <laughs> when the creators you respect so much really appreciate what you're making, it, it means something. So thank you. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate what he said about the variety of guests. And that was kind of our goal from the beginning because escape rooms are such a multidisciplinary medium. It draws from so many different things that, you know, we think it really behooves creators to expose themselves to as many disciplines, adjacent disciplines as possible, like board games, board game mechanics, like LARP and, you know, immersive theater, all, all of those things, which, and, and they're all fun and interesting topics. <laughs> yeah, completely agree. Okay. We're going to take a little break because Steve created a game, which I know nothing about. I actually know nothing about it. I have in our script here, Steve's mystery game of mystery. 
Yay! I'm so excited. I love games. I, I love that the yay had a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> It's time to play everybody's favorite podcast game, Name That Guest. That's right. Our contestants will have to listen closely to unscramble the voices of their favorite past guests. All right, PG and David, here's how the game works. I'm going to play a clip from a past episode of the Reality Escape pod. It could be from season one, two, or three, and you'll take turns attempting to identify the speaker. But we're not going to make it too easy for you. First, you'll hear it in reverse at twice speed for a chance at six points. If you can't get it, you'll hear it in reverse at normal speed for a chance at four points. And finally, you'll hear it forwards at four times speed for a chance at two points. Now, if you give a wrong answer, your opponent can use a steal for half of the points. But be strategic because you can only use it once per guest. So choose your moment. I am so excited for this game show. <laughs> All right, PG, we flipped a coin backstage and you won the opportunity to choose your set of questions. Would you like questions A or B? A. All right, PG has chosen A. And audience members, remember, you can play along at home, so listen closely. Okay, this audio clip is for PG. Okay, that was a guest we've had in the past at twice speed in reverse. PG, can you name that guest? I feel like I kind of maybe know who it is, but I'm a little bit worried that I'm being a little overconfident. So maybe I will go to the second stage. Okay, David, would you like to steal? Uh, was it Ann Lukeman? It was not. Oh. Okay, that was your steal opportunity. You don't have any more steals for this guest. PG, here is this guest in reverse at normal speed. All right, PG, your chance for four points. Do you have a guess? Okay, so I, I it kind of sounds like Lisa, but I'm going to go with Hillary Manning. Hillary Manning is incorrect. Oh! Okay, for a chance at two points, here's the clip forward at four times speed. All right, PG. Oh my God. Um, gosh, that was really, I really thought it was Hillary. Is it Lisa? Is it Lisa? It really sounds like Lisa. Okay, I need a final answer. Um, Wild Optimus. All right, let's have a listen to the clip at normal speed. And I'll add that there's no shortage of people who want God to talk it. at I knew it. I knew this it was Lisa. We uh, both asked Cindy about. I feel so but much shame. We had tons and tons of people offer ideas, more than we could possibly have this year, some that we'll have next year or whenever the time is right. All right. So that was Lisa talking about recon from season two. I think I win. <laughs> Lisa gets I the knew points. it was I knew it was Lisa. Why did I second guess myself? You know what? I, All points <laughs> go to me. I'm glad I, I I'm glad for the record that I did say that I think it's Lisa. <laughs> for, for what it's worth, I had it I had it at round two. I shouldn't have stolen so early. I was trying to be too bold. <laughs> he did. I can vouch that he had it at round two. So therefore I win. <laughs> I'm slightly cheating because I'm looking at the list of guests and the recon episode does not have specific names. It just says like the recon episode. So it, it, it kind of was like not at the forefront of my mind. But I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought, who wouldn't use Lisa because she's right here. <laughs> All right. Question two. And this one is for David. All right, David, do you have a guess? Brian Corbett, final answer. All right, let's have a listen to it at normal speed. 
it actually started out as a joke with some other monsters where they just got a clipboard and a flashlight and stood in front of an alleyway that literally led nowhere. And they held a sign that said the VIP maze and people would come by and be like, is this a, is this an attraction? They're like, well, um, l- l- hold on. Are you on the list? All right. That was Brian Corbett working at Not Scary Farms as a monster. And that was a story from season two, episode six. Very good, David. I knew David was going to smoke me. Also, that was like the one knit voice I would probably recognize also. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. This next one is for PG. Are you ready, PG? Uh, no, but OK, go ahead. <laughs> All right, PG, do you have a guess? I want to say Rita Orlov, but I'm not 100% sure. It sounds like, is it Rita? Maybe it's Gabby? I feel like it's Rita. I'm sorry, Rita is not correct. David, would you like to try for steel? Yes, I would. That sounded like it was at like 3x speed in reverse, which is why I think it was Johanna. Because she was a fast speaking guest. That is incorrect. Uh, You've lost right. your steel. Okay, PG. Just trying to keep this fair for you, PG. <laughs> all right, PG. Reverse at normal speed for four points. All right, PG. Now I'm going to say Hillary Manning. Hillary Manning is incorrect. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so bad at this. Okay, here is forward at four times speed for two points. But Lisa's nodding like she knows who it is. Is that Anne Lukeman? It is not Anne Lukeman. I'm sorry. How many females do we have on this? Like, what? like I've gone through all of them. <laughs> Let's have a listen. And so I remember counting oh and I think God. I got up to like 45 and I was already skeptical. Like I was like, oh, I can't remember if I counted that one. You also have no way of writing out there. There's no pens, so you can't like get a pen and highlight the triangles. People were saying you could use sand. Show me how you could drop 45 triangles in the sand and like not lose track. I don't think you could. And that was Gabby talking about the triangle puzzle on Survivor. All right, question four is for David. Are you ready, David? Let's do it. All right, David. Pass. Okay, David, pass. PG, would you like to use your steel here? Hell no. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Reverse at normal speed. David, do you have a guess? I'm passing. Is it Anthony Robinson? It is not Anthony Robinson. I'm sorry. I figured I had to try before David got it right on the next turn. <laughs> okay, here we go. Forward at four times speed. Was it Miles Nye? It was not Miles Nye. Let's have a listen to the actual clip. People are always like, oh, you're ripping off IP. Go ahead, rip off IP, make <laughs> wizard school. Guys, make wizard school. Make some four house sorcery. Make a uh, large castle in the countryside where basically kids are given PTSD by dark magic wizards for four years. <laughs> All right, guys, who was it? You okay. heard it first That's from Nick, Nick Moran. <laughs> now I'm feeling shame. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question five, and this goes to PG. PG, any guesses? Is that NPH? It is not. David, would you like to go for the steal? No. Okay, next one. Here was the 
Okay, any guesses? Is that Chris Latner? It is not Chris Latner. God, God damn it. David, would you like to go for the steal? Uh, was it John Braver? It was John Braver. That was my Very second good. guess. I, I was going to say John Braver or Alon Lee. Those are going to be my next guesses. Let's take a listen to the clip. This was from episode eight of season two. We're practicing. I'm pulling the barrel of the gun out from my side so we can wrap the whip around. And he's really good. And I'm just looking at him like, oh, my God, I'm just hanging out with him and practicing <laughs> a scene with him. And then I started leaning my face into it a little bit towards the barrel and like closing my eyes because a part of me wanted to get whipped and cut. So I had a, a scar for a great story to be able to tell people, oh, yeah, what happened there? Oh, yeah. Indiana Jones. <laughs> Love that episode. <laughs> it's John trying to get whipped by Harrison Ford. <laughs> Me too, John. Me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving on. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, David, who is not guest? Okay, that one sounds like it's at 4x speed, and that is Johanna. Confident. That is correct. That Let's was the only the one clip. I knew. I, that one I knew that was Johanna, too. Like, that sounded exactly like her. There is this artist, I forget their name suddenly, very famous photographer, who takes these pieces of 2,000 people in a square in some city in the world, and all of the people are naked. And when we're thinking about, like, social norms... Normally, you do not take all of your clothes off and go stand in a market square at 4 a.m. in the morning, which is when they have to do this because, you know, otherwise there would be scandals. Um, but I think also if you were to come home from a club and you would be passing through this square and 2,000 people around you are standing around naked, you'd start to feel a lot of social pressure to maybe also start taking your clothes off a little bit because that's where normal has shifted. <laughs> That was the only I was that was the only one I actually did know. Brian's like your best friend. <laughs> I, I kind of knew the Brian I knew the Brian one also, actually. Like he had a very distinct way of talking that you could even hear backwards. Like I'm like, how does Johannes sound the same forwards and backwards? Like I don't <laughs> Back to PG. Here we go. All right, PG. This was no a female idea. from season two, early in season two. Oh, look at look at. Oh, you're, just, you're just giving it to her now. now. He's feel like he feels sorry for, for me, so now he's just giving them to me. For what it's worth, <laughs> I had it before he gave any hints. Okay, well, the, it's, it, the only person it could be is Sarah Zhang, which I would never have recognized in a million years. Let's have a listen. I would say most of the game has almost zero puzzle solving element. It's more about the setting is getting like crazier and crazier. I know some of the big expensive rooms, they have the, you need to go down to water, jump down from a, a really tall mountain. And then you got like swim and you have food in the game room. It's like going all crazy. Very good. That was Sarah Zhang. I was, I, I mean, if you hadn't given me the hint, I was going to say Roxanne from Immersia. I feel like I could hear an accent like some of some sort. And I was like, it's got to be somebody maybe with like a slightly accented English. <laughs> all right. And then the final question for David. Okay, David. I do not know. Okay. Can I guess? Sure. Is that Rita? <laughs> that is Rita. Very Woo! good. <laughs> PG with the steel. And we'll have a listen to the clip. I've had some people who were pretty new to puzzles who ended up enjoying the story a little bit more because they, they felt like that was a reward for all of their work for solving a puzzle was to get a piece of the story. 
Okay, stand by with us while we tabulate the scores, and let's have a word from our sponsors. <laughs> Today's episode has been brought to you by Playtesting. Always play tests. It's very important to have a fair game. <laughs> and by. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Virtual Escape Games. Virtual Escape Games specializes in virtual team building adventures for teams anywhere around the globe, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. PG, in the early 2000s, I was working as a computer repair technician and removing a lot of malware from a lot of people's computers. So when we sat down to play CyberDocs, brought back some memories. Blast from the past. <laughs> yep, the not that distant past, although it's further back than it feels like. CyberDocs was a humorous, approachable, family-friendly game corporate friendly game it's the kind of game that i would have a good time with the family the game was really really fun actually i thought they had some really clever moments and some really surprising things that i i, I didn't expect from this type of game so i'll just leave it at that i won't spoil anything else i'm glad we got to play that one together I think there's a reason why Virtual Escape Games has been so successful in the corporate team building world. Their games are super accessible for everybody to play, and I love that they're able to scale it up to a large team. For non-hosted games, one to six players, you can get 20% off using the code REA20. And for your team building adventures, you can also knock off 20% with the code TB20. All of this is available for you at virtualescapegames.com. These details are in the show notes. All right, and we're back. We've tabulated the scores, and it looks like David has won the game. Congratulations, David. <laughs> to nobody's surprise. Woo! I feel like the real winner here is Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, how many of those did you know right off the bat? More than PG and less than David. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, thanks for playing. Thanks for being a good sport. Well, thank you so much for making it. Okay, we're diving back into the mailbag here. Scott Olson in California asks, Johanna discussed the concept of play to lose, and both David and PG have talked about how their approach to escape games has changed over time in a similar way where you play to experience instead of just being focused on winning. When did that change for you? Is your approach dynamic based on where you are playing and who you are playing with? David posted about playing the basement casually. Why was that? And when don't you play this way? P.S. Everyone, please join their Patreon so that they can quit their real jobs. Oh my god. Love that. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> so the way that Lisa and I approach playing is very dynamic. In the case of playing the basement casually, I think that was when we played the courtyard and we had an overpowered team. We were playing with some really skilled players and any two or three of us probably could have gotten through that game comfortably, but we had a room full of, of heavy hitters. So yeah, that would definitely be a time to play casually because if you don't play casually, you just miss everything if you've got people who are really overpowered. So we can turn it on. We can play really hard. And the times that we do, there's a couple of times. One is if Lisa and I are traveling, just the two of us, and we go into a game and the owner says like, hey, this is not really made for two people. You, you really should have at least four or five. We'll turn it on and play hard. The other time we'll play hard that we're less happy to do is if we're getting the vibe that like there is a an adversarial thing going on, like they want us to lose. Um, sometimes we encounter an owner or a game master who you really feel like they're kind of against you. And in the case of us, the vibe that we're getting from them is like they want to beat the experts. And so when that happens, we can play real dirty too. We can we'll, we'll, we'll play hard, but I'll also dip into my bag of tricks to figure out how to decode things quicker, figure out what locks will tell me, bypass things. If, if I get the feeling that somebody really wants us to lose, there's a competitive side of me that is savage about it. I want to answer the question in the middle of that paragraph. When did that change for you? Because I know exactly when it changed for us. It changed when we started to understand how the games were put together. 
we used to play escape rooms really hard because we wanted we wanted to win, of course, but we wanted to make sure we got through it all and we saw the whole game and we didn't ever know how much game was left. Like we had no idea when we were new what we were stepping into and what might be a door, whether there was even another door in this room, anything could happen. The game could be big or small or who knows. The more we became comfortable with the fact that we really understood how the game was functioning and we were going to have a complete experience and we could relax a little bit and take it in and not feel like we had to be really focused all the time on getting through it. Also, 2014, 2015, the games were harder. There was more nonsense puzzles. There was more content, I would say. A lot of the owners were really obsessed with keeping the win rate slow. So winning was not assured. Once we reach a point where winning is assured in almost every case, you can kind of tip over into the other extreme where you know you knock out a room in 20, 25 minutes. Like the fastest we played a 60 minute room was 12 minutes. And that's not satisfying at all. It sounds like if you're if you're new to this, it sounds like, oh, setting a record's awesome. Paying $30 per person and getting out of the room in 12 minutes is not awesome. Yeah. It, for me, it was a confluence of finding a group that I played regularly with where I knew we were going to win. So, you know, and, and I don't feel like it's not like it's bragging. It's just like we just I, I know that we're going to. And also because my group, we also don't shy away from asking for hints. It's not like we never ask for hints. Like we'll ask for hints if we get stuck. But because we know that we want to get through the entire room. Right. And so when I feel comfortable knowing that we are going to get through the entire room, I can kind of relax a little bit more. But also it was when we started seeking out rooms that are very high quality. So when you're seeking out rooms that are very high quality and you know they're going to have great scenery and you've paid a lot for them, you're going to want to slow down and take some time to enjoy the experience. Yeah. Who do we have up next? Hey, David and PG. This is Michael Anderson. Longtime listener, first time caller. One of my favorite parts about the Reality Escape Pod is how you set up all these interesting conversations in areas outside the traditional escape room space that are still highly relevant for players and creators who are in that space. Everything from board games and LARP to Survivor with a side of a little more Survivor. In that spirit, what's a non-escape room thing that you would love more escape room fans to experience to broaden their horizons of what's possible? So that's Michael Anderson from ARGNET, A-R-G-N. Uh, he's been writing about ARGs for a very long time. My feeling is I would encourage escape room fans, if the only immersive or puzzle or gaming perspective you have is escape rooms, pick anything else. Branch off in whatever direction interests you, whether you're a creator or a consumer. Um, it's going to give you different perspectives. I don't think that everyone has to get all of their entertainment in an escape room at $35 an hour or something like that. There are wonderful puzzle hunts. Puzzle hunting is inexpensive in terms of money, definitely expensive in terms of time. There's a steep learning curve. ARGs are a really cool avenue to explore. They tend to be over the internet. They tend to be really global. The good ones have communities that build up around them. There's a, there's a whole social dynamic to ARGs that you can explore. Video games, tabletop games, Immersive theater, LARP, all of these things. I mean, there's a reason why we are bringing on creators from all of these different spaces. They're all interrelated. And if you like escape rooms, you probably will get something out of at least one of the things that I just mentioned. So yeah, explore whatever sounds cool. So what I'll throw out there also, this may not be getting into another medium, but if you are an enthusiast, I would recommend actually that you join up with some of these enthusiast meetup groups or like our Patreon, um, I think being able to meet people at these, like I know LA has a pretty big enthusiast scene. And I think that's really cool where you get to like, we have meetups and you can meet other players where you can talk about things. You can find other people to play with. And I think a lot of people have met friends that they've played with. They've, they've met people to play with together. And so I think that's actually another fun avenue of being able to kind of explore and be in this hobby and make it a little bit more social and not this kind of insular thing. Because ultimately, when you're in a room, you're just in there by yourself. So join these groups and become part of the larger community. And I think that it will make overall um, playing escape rooms much more rewarding for you. 
All right. What's our next voicemail? Yeah, hey, this is uh, Bill. I booked uh, the Sudoku Shuffle for 6 o'clock. I was wanting to make sure uh, I bought three tickets, but I'm going to bring nine people. Uh, I got two <laughs> infants and a dog as well. The dog is a Bida, so he's going to come in with his, um, you know, little bite guard on, but he's able to, you know, take it off. So I just want to warn you in advance. We're going to leave him in your office or wherever you got your people uh, watching us, your little dungeon masters or whatever you call them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we got the Sudoku Shuffle game. And then we wanted to see, we're going to be about half an hour late. I hope that's okay. Uh, also, uh, we're scared of everything. So tell me it's not scary. Uh, <laughs> the review said everything. it wasn't scary. Uh, and even though it said it's extremely difficult and not for uh, beginners, uh, we've never done one of these escape rooms before. So I hope that's okay. Uh, but yeah, this is Bill. Uh, Good, uh, good, good, good uh, talking to you. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon for the game. Um, oh, and uh, we want to uh, get a discount. Uh, uh, we're off, otherwise, we're going to leave a negative review on Yelp. So uh, <laughs> see you soon. Bye bye. Thanks, wow. Bill. Nailed every, nailed every trigger. <laughs> Bill, Bill sounds like a real prince. <laughs> The next one, we had a voicemail came through, sort of. It was very, very choppy. And uh, so I couldn't hear who the caller was. I think I heard them say they were from California. And what I got out of it was they wanted us to talk about the political issues surrounding escape room themes and I think stories, which is a deep topic. The politics surrounding escape room themes are complicated. And I think that they are, they're a deeper problem than escape rooms. Like take prison breaks as an example. Politically, the United States have an, has an over-incarceration problem. Don't think that's a jarring thing to say there. The, the, the stats support, we, we, we incarcerate a lot of people. Turning that into a game, person that I was really close with growing up ended up in, ended up in jail, uh, ended up in prison, really. I have worked for district attorney's office. I have worked on the side of people who were putting people in prison. And there's a good and ugly on all sides of this. Systems are not really well structured. But um, the thing is that when it comes to these things as an escape room theme, escape room themes only work in most of these cases, especially mid-tier to low-tier escape room creators, are working off of resonant themes, things that exist out in the public already. When you play a tomb adventure game, you're not thinking back to history class. You're thinking about Indiana Jones. When you play a prison break game, you're thinking about the countless prisons that have shown up in popular culture, in movies, in TV, in video games. When you go and play an asylum game, you are not thinking about the, you know, about the realities of psychiatric care in the United States and the, the state of it, which leaves a lot to be desired. You're thinking about the way that all of this has been popularized in media that reaches a lot more people than an escape room does. In some ways, this may sound like oh, I'm passing the buck. Like I, I do think that there is more work that can and should be done in the escape room medium. But I think that if we waved a magic wand today and removed prison games and asylum games, which I think are probably the more common offenders in this realm. If we removed all of those things from escape rooms all around the world, we will have not moved the needle at all in terms of fixing the actual problem, which is the popularization of what these tropes of the escape room creators are working with are. So that's my take on it. I'd like to see escape room creators do better. I think a lot of them are, and I think we're moving further and further away from this in a lot of places. But there are bigger societal problems that run far deeper and fixing those will cascade into escape rooms, not the other way around. Hey folks, I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about something that I've been working on with a bunch of people from the team over here for years. We've been wanting to host Recon, the Reality Escape Convention, in person in Boston for a very long time. And circumstances have halted that effort. But not this year. We're doing it. 
August 21st and 22nd of 2022 in Boston. Recon is happening. We are blending Escape Room Conference with the tours we've been producing for years to produce a proper Escape Room convention. You'll meet people, you'll play games, you'll hear wonderful talks. It's gonna be a great time, and I truly hope that you come and join us. Tickets for Recon are available now. You can learn more at realityescapecon.com. Details in the show notes. PG, you made a game for us too. <laughs> I did, and um, you guys are all welcome to work together to figure this out if need be. So David has played a version of this before. It is basically, I don't have a name for it. It is my portmanteau game. So basically I am going to give you a two-part clue and it will refer to two different phrases and they will combine together with a shared syllable. Okay, so for example, if I say a sonar device for when someone double crosses you, you would say betraydar. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. yes. So um, the first half of this game is going to be escape room related clues. At least one of the clues will kind of be escape room related. Okay. And I have uh, the order of the clue will usually, it will be the order of the phrases where it comes. Okay, so the first one is a type of cipher that swings back and forth. A type of cipher that swings back and forth. I'm going to say it wrong. It's a seesaw and a Caesar cipher somehow? No. Okay. <laughs> but that was, that, but that, no, but that's, but that's very good. That's why I couldn't say it, because it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I got it. Okay, go, Steve. Pig pendulum. Yes. Ding, ding, oh. ding, ding. ding. <laughs> nice. Very good. A pig pendulum. <laughs> okay, I like it. All right. The next one is a colorful, misleading clue for a famous Johnny Cash song. I know half of it. <laughs> I think I got this one, too. Red herring. Right. <laughs> of you... fire. Red herring of fire. Ding, nice. ding, ding. There you go. Steve. Steve is blowing this game out of the water. I like Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next one is a delicious treat enjoyed by separated groups. A delicious treat enjoyed by separated groups. A banana split start. The ding. There you go, Lisa. <laughs> I was a banana split you. start. <laughs> All right. These next ones are probably are getting a little bit harder. I warmed you up with the easier ones. A long speech by one person about a problem requiring deductive reasoning. A monologic puzzle. There you go. Ding! A monologic puzzle. Very good. All right. This last one may be a little bit of a stretch, but I have an additional hint if you need it. A microcomputer made of helium, neon, and argon. A microcomputer made of helium, neon, and argon. Microcomputer, would that be an Arduino? A something noble gas. Yeah, or inert gases. Is it, are they inert mm -hmm. or noble? What's a microcomputer? Arduino is the first one that jumps to mind. You guys said it already. An Ad Arduino noble gas. <laughs> an Arduino noble gas. <laughs> oh, wow. Steve got half, I got half, and Lisa put it together. Nice. Go team. Good, good teamwork. Good. There you guys go. All right. This, um, and then the second half of the clues are all going to involve a previous guest. Okay? So okay. it will be either the name of the guest or their company. A puppet-loving designer sings this famous song by The Verve. So Brian is Brian Corbett is the puppet loving designer. A puppet loving designer sings this famous song by The Verb. I think that's Bittersweet Symphony. So Brian Corbett Bittersweet Symphony. There yeah, you go. ding, there you go. <laughs> I'll just Brian... put it together for you guys all day. <laughs> Brian Corbett Bittersweet Symphony. <laughs> nice. He's going to love that. 
<laughs> Very appropriate for Ryan. <laughs> An official representing a country abroad who designs games. An official representing a country abroad who designs games. Emissary. A uh, diplomat. That's what I was thinking. Designs games. A diplomat leacock. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> diplomat leacock. <laughs> nice. Good, good job, Lisa. This famous game designer likes to dance with only sunglasses, socks, and a button-down white shirt. Risky business, Tom Cruise. This famous game designer likes to dance with only sunglasses, socks, and a button-down white shirt. So you know that it's probably risky business, and it is going to yeah. be the second half. Chris. Very Chris. famous. A very, oh, very famous. Very famous. Neil Patrick Harris, whatever the other business. part of it was. Yeah. <laughs> Neil Patrick Harris, key business. <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw I was like if I put actor you guys are gonna know right away I had to, <laughs> I had to swerve a little bit on that one <laughs> all right this German escape room designer plays my nickname for David's favorite game <laughs> Chris Latner something nerd <laughs> yeah nerd something oh are we here are we tight <laughs> Uh, David, put it together. Is, it, is this is this a hero clicks thing? <laughs> put it together, David. <laughs> Chris Lat Nerd. Say the other half of it. Oh, Chris Lat Nerd clicks. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Chris PG trolling Lat Nerd hard. clicks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, David. I had to put that last one in just for my it. own amusement. I love it. It's so good. <laughs> All right. That was PG's portmanteau game. I like the portmanteau game. <laughs> that was awesome. Have, I win that one too. I win yeah. both games. <laughs> Do you, have we talked about mine and Lisa's portmanteau? No. Our portmanteau is livid. Half of Lisa and half of David. We used it on everything at our wedding. Our parents were not thrilled. <laughs> they were, in fact, very livid. <laughs> you could say that, yes. <laughs> okay, we have a few more things left in the mailbag. We're going to try and get through these a little bit quicker. Jared and Zach from the Puzzling Company podcast asked two questions. We noticed that a lot of live immersive experiences are incorporating traditional board game mechanics into their live game play. Do you think this is something that will stay niche or develop into something that is more mainstream? I think that cross-pollination is forever. And yeah, I think people will be pulling from board games, from video games, from TV, from everything. And if they stop doing that, they're going to die off. Cross-pollination is the way. The second question I really like, PG, in your opinion, if David was selected to be on Survivor, how far would he make it? Ooh, I think David would make it pretty far, actually. Um, David is a certain archetype, um, probably like kind of that nerd super fan. Well, everybody's a super fan nowadays, but um, I think that he would survive long enough to make it to the end. And then I don't think he would piss too many people off. And I think that he would be really good at being an asset and getting along with everyone. So I, I think David, I think you should audition, actually. I think you would do really well. That's the nicest thing you've ever said, PG. <laughs> <laughs> to me, at least. If, you're, if, if your allergies don't kill you out there. <laughs> I'm more afraid of my body failing me out there than I am uh, playing the game. <laughs> and the Puzzling Company podcast. Fantastic tabletop puzzle escape game podcast. If you haven't checked it out, you really should. We've been guests on there. PG has been a guest on there. They do a really great show, and I think they're deeply underappreciated. The next question is from Simon Edwards in London, who asks, I'm going to ask a question I asked David back at Eric 2019, but perhaps a little bit more succinctly. 
What's the closest example you've seen of a fully mimetic escape room as opposed to a fully diegetic one? Do you think it's wise for designers to even attempt such things? And do you think the public would appreciate it enough? Can we define mimetic, please? There's a whole bunch of things I'm going to define right now. So first of all, ERIC is the UK Escape Room Conference. Second of all, mimetic and diegetic. I'm going to just give you the definitions that Errol has put into. He he put a piece out on diegeses versus mimeses on his website, thecodex.ca. We'll put a link in the show notes for you. We're diving deep into academics of narrative and puzzle design here. So I'm going to make this quick. A puzzle is diegetic if it fits the theme and reality of its game universe. This relates to how the puzzle looks. The props and parts of the puzzle fit in the universe of the game and do not look out of place. So this is taking puzzles and things and wrapping them in a world that feels right, which is what you see from most great escape room companies. Like you're collecting ingredients for a potion, right? Like you're making a potion, something like that. Yeah. You're, you know, you're finding a whole bunch of jars. You're going to put them in a, on a thing and it's going to trigger something like it all is wrapped up and themed appropriately. A mimetic puzzle is one where its existence and solution reflect the reality of its game universe. This relates to how closely the puzzle matches reality as we know it. So an example of that is like, instead of finding hidden keys somewhere, you're just given a set of lock picks and told like, yeah, every time there's a lock, you can pick it. It's where your behavior is truly representative of what you should be doing in that scenario in real life without the artifice of escape rooms and puzzles and all of this stuff. I haven't really seen very many like purely mimetic escape rooms. I've seen plenty of mimetic interactions in escape rooms. I've been told, I think there's a company in Toronto, I think called Revo or Revo that has mimetic games. I haven't played them myself. That doesn't sound fun. I mean, it, it, I imagine that it can be. I think part of the problem with mimetic design is that like, if any of it involves being trapped and a natural part of that is smash. If you are trapped with urgency, mimetic is break. It is destroy. And so I think that a lot of it is, is, is not necessarily a hill worth climbing. I think that diegetic game design is way more than enough. I've seen it done a couple of times where it was fun. Like I did that one, I think King's Ransom, I forget what the name of it was, where it was like kind of a post-apocalyptic times and there's this poster teaching you how to break a zip tie and then mm-hmm. we eventually get a bunch of things that are tied with zip ties and we did the thing and it whoa like you were able to saw through a zip tie like with a string you yep. know and i was like this was actually a very good life skill <laughs> to have learned from an escape room yeah there's i think one off mimetic puzzles can be great i think striving to go and build a mimetic a fully mimetic game or going even further and saying that you want to make a fully mimetic company. I don't know that it's a selling feature. Like I don't know that enough players are discerning enough to go and like the fact that I like we're defined, we, we feel the need to even define and distinguish what these terms mean that the general consuming audience isn't going to know enough to go and say, well, I want to go with that company because their games are mimetic. I'm trying to escape reality anyway. I agree. I feel like you would be in a rather task-based scenario because that's kind of what life is. (laughs) So yeah, if you can make it work, great. But I would say that I I don't think it's worth climbing up that hill unless you have a really great idea for it. All right. The next question is coming from Chris Dixon in the UK. A little ancient history for those who weren't around at the dawn of escape rooms. Chris was I believe the first UK escape room blogger of sorts, he created exitgames.uk, which was a directory, which he later turned over to Ken Ferguson from The Logic Escapes Me. So Chris writes, is auteur culture a problem in escape room and puzzle event design culture? Are there aspects to which focusing on individual creators risks engendering such a culture? even among films and video games that are well regarded for the thoughtfulness and representation they show, we sometimes hear well-placed tales of people behind them having patterns of abusive behavior. While just about 
all the game and puzzle design people I've met have been delightful and very clearly on the side of angels. Some people have been called out for their behavior or even more so bragged about it. Separating an artist from their work is a challenge in all fields, so it should come as no surprise that it's one to be faced in our own, though happily, as far as I can tell, to a very limited extent. I'd rather play a 4 out of 5 game from someone known to be kind than a 5 out of 5 game from someone known to be a jerk. Okay, so there is a lot going on in this question, and I I wrote back to Chris to confirm the inspiration for this, which I was pretty confident when I read the question comes from a People Make Games video. Uh, If you haven't checked out the People Make Games YouTube channel, it's fantastic. They've actually done a video on escape rooms, which is one of the better videos on escape rooms on YouTube. They recently put out a video about abusive behavior from famous designers in the indie video game space, all linked to Annapurna Interactive. It's a heartbreaking video to watch. It's very well produced. It's very well researched. But it basically tells a story of people whose outward appearance was that they were wonderful people making beautiful games, frequently games that were very tender. And you would just assume that the person behind it had to be a good, empathetic human being. Seems like that might not always be the case. You know, I am completely confident that there are abusive creators in the escape room space, that there are people who are bad bosses, who are terrible to their employees. It's hard to know who. It's hard to know how we as a community ought to engage with that. It's something that we recently struggled with in a slightly different way. There's a company that we're putting out reviews for where the owner put out a very racist tirade. This guy had very strong opinions on black people and was very comfortable making those opinions known on Facebook, knowing full well that he was Facebook friends with many other owners, players, reviewers in his community. And while our approach to reviewing has always been focused on the game itself and not the creator, What we're doing with those reviews is we are going to put a note in the review that this person has some very strong negative opinions about Black people. And if that is something that affects your buying decision, this person felt very comfortable making it known. And so we're just going to make it known that they made it known. Not something that I really wanted to be doing, to be honest. It was, you know, I mean, it's it's inevitable that we're going to be tackling issues like this now and into the future. But it's definitely not what Lisa and I got into this for. And I think for every creator who makes a statement like that well known, I'm sure there are people that we just don't know whether they're good or bad people. We don't know the people who make half the games we play. We don't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say that if you're listening to this, think really carefully about how you interact with your employees, the way you treat them, the way that you treat them when you disagree with them. I think is really important. Figuring out how to disagree and even pull rank on a person in a way that doesn't make them feel demoralized, broken, depressed. These are important soft skills to have as a business owner. So if you aren't good at this, if you think you might not be good at this, these are things that you should probably try and figure out because, you know, over time, people do talk and your employees are humans. You know, they need to they need to be treated with respect. It's a deep question. It's a hard question. And that's not a complete answer, but it's the one I have for you now. And I, I do really appreciate the question. Okay. It looks like this is the last question. This question is from Augie. Hey y'all, as a fan, I've adored every episode of the podcast. I could gush about it incessantly, although I usually just send you guys DMs and rave about each. The guests are fantastic. The questions are actually interesting and intriguing and make every episode feel unique. And it's my current favorite source of inspiration. I love being able to listen to it with my projects in mind and consistently finding actionable takeaways. Also, I know it's not the sexiest aspect, but the editing is so unreal good, that's in all caps, compared to most content. It makes the experience so much better. 
Between us, I find myself going back to other podcasts every once in a while and not being able to make it through an episode. I love their content, but the volume tends to vacillate so much that it's legit frustrating. As an enthusiast, I love my city of Cincinnati, but dang, I am content starved. We've already lost a few rooms to the pandemic, and having options like the escape game and breakout are nice, but I've also been spoiled by rooms in Europe and some bigger U.S. cities that make the local games feel like they're scratching the itch, but maybe not be the most satisfying experiences. One thing I'm hoping to do this summer is some more local trips to nearby cities, and I'm going to try to lean more into enthusiast groups to see if others are interested in meeting up. As a friend, seriously, I adore y'all. I'm absolutely stoked to catch up in Boston at Recon and hopefully more often. You the best. Can't wait to game. Thanks, Augie. That's Augie from the Recon team. He makes our ARG and we love you too, Augie. Cincinnati had a couple of fantastic escape games and unfortunately they are no longer around, but there were a couple of true gems in Cincinnati. And um, rest in peace. And thanks, Augie, for the shout out on the editing. And of course, I share that with David. You know, David always is trying to keep it tight, making people want more when it's over. But I really appreciate it. I think the editing improved dramatically when Steve got involved. I was over editing. I think Steve has uh, balanced things out and also brings a lot more skill and knowledge to the uh, table than I had. I really feel like we've hit a really good groove and uh, I love having you as a collaborator on this. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's supposed to be like the score in a movie. You know, you're supposed to just not notice it because it's just so silky smooth. And I I hope we're getting there. I think we're getting there. We're, We're getting better every time. It's at this point that I am going to take a second and ask you if you have made it to the end of this episode, you're a true fan. We know this because this is off the beaten path for us. So if you haven't had a chance to review us on Apple Podcasts, please go and leave a five-star review and some nice words on Apple Podcasts. We are trying to juice the algorithm a little bit, and it helps us a ton when people go and do that. And, you know, tell your friends. We are trying very hard to turn this into something more, and we can only do that with you. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for telling your friends. Thank you for leaving the review. If you can afford it, thank you for backing us on Patreon. Whatever it is you're choosing to do, we appreciate it so much. And you didn't just hear it from us. You also heard it from Scott Olson. The tell your friends part of it is so important and not just tell people over Facebook, but when you're physically in a room with somebody that's a friend of yours, you're playing a game or you're on Zoom, that personal recommendation is so powerful, not just reposting it. For sure. But repost too. (laughs) Yeah. I just want to give a thank you to all of the listeners who called in with voicemails and questions. It was really, really exciting to hear from you guys and I really appreciate your questions if you guys like the mailbag episode if you like suggesting topics or you like hearing David and I answer more questions please let us know continue writing us emails or sending us messages on Twitter and if we get enough of these we'll do more mailbag episodes yeah for sure thank you all very much the reality escape pod is produced by Lisa Spira, edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media, and brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. I want to take a moment to thank some of our highest level backers. This podcast would not exist without your support. Thank you so much to Breakout Games, Derek Tam, Jonathan Driscoll, Byron Delmonico, Paula Swan, Rex Miller, and Scott Olson. Thank you so much for your support. The first game that we played with Steve was a jarring experience. Not really representative of how escape rooms usually are. We 
all met up at this company. We were greeted by a very attractive woman in black less, leather. Yeah, black leather. She 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 was very in charge, and she led us out of the building and around a very large building in the cold. And she was she was a trooper in that black leather and heels. And we walk around to the back of the building and down a flight of stairs. As we're doing that, she turns around, pulls a gun on Steve and starts making a whole bunch of demands. And it was in that moment that I was very happy that we were not in a concealed carry state. <laughs> this is part of the game. Yeah. Yes. I just went with it. I sort of yes ended it and I just... I never for one minute thought it was a real gun because I knew it was part of the fiction, but uh, I think I just kind of rolled with the punches. I can't even remember what she was demanding of you, only that she pulled a gun and demanded something. I can't either. The adrenaline was flowing, I'm sure. I thought you guys had shown up at the wrong type of club. (laughs) (laughs) 